Hey Hippophile, this week Xiaomi seems to be following Huawei in making their own mobile chips. ARM IPO'd finally, and they have a whole new business model to go along with it, and Unity managed to upset everyone in the gaming industry. Welcome to the Fire Checkout. This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Okay, this week we'll start the brief with Apple's big launch event. You've probably heard by now that there are new iPhones with USB-C, titanium frames, a new customizable action button, and a new 5X optical zoom camera on the Pro Max model. Weirdly, the non-Pro iPhones are still sticking with a baffling 60Hz screen, but given that Apple actually managed to drop the price in some countries like Germany and the UK, gasp, while they kept them the same in most other countries, makes me think that this is almost forgivable. Anyway, the Pro models now also get the new A17 processor, which is the first mass-manufactured chip using TSMC's 3 nanometer process, and there's a new set of Apple Watches too, which also got their first new chip after three generations of basically the same SoC. Apple was surprisingly tight-lipped about the performance on both of these chips, so we'll just have to wait and see how they perform. No big surprises, I guess, but given that these are the world's best-selling smartphones and smartwatches as well, I guess they didn't have to fix what wasn't broken. Now, in bad news for Apple, the company had to sign on with Qualcomm again to access their modems for iPhones. Apple has been trying to make its own wireless components for years, and it will apparently postpone those until at least 2026 in a likely admission of defeat. It's interesting to see that while the M series chips and their computers have been doing fantastic, the progress in the mobile space, for their chips at least, hasn't actually been all that impressive lately. Anyway, moving on, a massive court trial between the US and Google also started, with a lawsuit filed by the Justice Department. They accused Google of illegally maintaining their dominance in search and the advertising technology market. The first couple of days haven't really revealed anything super exciting just yet, but as usual, I expect a whole flood of internal emails and memos and spicy testimonials to come very soon. And talking of juicy things, HP unveiled the Spectre Foldable 3-in-1, which is a 17-inch foldable laptop and the world's thinnest, apparently, with a built-in kickstand, a detachable keyboard, and, wait for it, a $5,000 price tag. 5,000? Anyway, in less insane news, Nothing's summer brand CMF is expected to launch its first new products, including a smartwatch and budget wireless earbuds on September 26th. HMD Global, the brand behind the revival of the Nokia phones, is expected to start making phones under its own brand instead of the one that it licenses from Nokia. And Huawei is now strongly rumored to attempt a return to the global phone market. Apparently, the company feels that with its own chips figured out, it now has a chance again, though I think the lack of Google services will be a real hindrance. Then, in good news, Intel announced Thunderbolt 5 this week, with the new spec offering 120 gigabits per second speeds, theoretical support for 540Hz monitors, 240 watts of charging power, and much more, while Blue Sky proudly announced that it now has 1 million users. Which, I guess, congrats, but that's actually way less than I thought they'd have, and I don't even know how many of those are actually still active, so I guess, yikes, a little bit. And if you're wondering, I mostly hang out on Mastodon these days. Anyway, lastly for the brief, the upcoming Xiaomi 13T got completely leaked ahead of its launch on September 26th, and interestingly, the flagship phone will feature a MediaTek Dimensity 9200 Plus SoC instead of a Snapdragon. Okay, and talking of Xiaomi and chips, my first story of the week is going to be that we got hot new rumors about the company trying to make a comeback and trying to make their own smartphone SoCs again. The rumor specifically talks about new job listings from the company that imply that they are hiring for a new mobile smartphone chip team. And I normally wouldn't read too much into just that on its own, but there are four other factors that actually make me think that this might be serious. First, the company has of course made an actual full SoC in the past, called the Surge S1, back in 2017, while they also still make smaller chips like the Surge P1 and G1 battery management and charging chips, so they wouldn't actually have to start from scratch. Second, Huawei has just this week signed a cross-licensing agreement with Xiaomi about a lot of patents that ends a long-standing fight between the two, and I guess those would be particularly useful if Xiaomi decided that it wanted to design its own chips. Third, I actually 
actually heard some pretty strong rumors from people in the industry a couple of months ago that Xiaomi was trying to hire a bunch of people who Oppo had just laid off when they closed their chip design division. So I didn't pay too much attention to it back then, but given this context, that makes a lot of sense. And fourth, Huawei has most likely proven that China's chip manufacturer, SMIC, is actually capable of making what are at least decent chips which consumers are willing to pay for. I think a lot of Chinese companies in the past have kind of just given up on trying to make their own chips because they realized that the manufacturing was the real bottleneck and that the US could just keep choking them if they ever got good at designing their own stuff. But now that the domestic chip manufacturing has at least gotten okay, it kind of starts making sense to think about designing chips domestically again too. Okay, and talking of designing chips, my second story of the week is going to be that ARM has finally IPO'd and that they found a new business model for them, which, believe it or not, is designing chips. So ARM went public yesterday on the Nasdaq stock exchange, starting at $55, valuing the company at about $54 billion altogether. And at the time of recording, their shares were up nearly 20%, which is good news for ARM and its owner SoftBank, as well as all the other tech companies that have invested in it. But one thing that ARM has been telling investors since is that it's not just going to design blueprints for chips for smartphones going forward, that it has previously sold to companies like Qualcomm to design their own chips on, but instead that ARM is now going to do the complex design work on specific products, or in other words, they're actually going to design chips themselves to suit their consumers' needs. So if a company like Xiaomi or another one, like, I don't know, Microsoft, for example, would want to have their own custom chip, they could just ask ARM to design it for them, starting with the CPU and the GPU. You might remember that Google, for example, basically asked Samsung to hand them their existing Exynos designs for their Tensor chip. But in the future, companies like it could just ask ARM to design something more unique. ARM definitely seems excited about this opportunity and investors are pumping the stock. So let's see where all of this goes. Okay, and for my third story of the week, Unity has managed to become the villain in basically the whole game development world overnight. So Unity, which is one of the world's leading game engines, out of the blue announced that it plans to charge its thousands and thousands of developers a fee each time a game made with their tech was installed. The fee is somewhere between 1 to 20 cents per install and should start on the 1st of January 2024, and the reaction was pretty universally that this was a disaster. An installation fee like this completely changes the economics of a game. Of course, game developers can't just swap a game engine halfway through release, plus it also applies to older titles as far as I know, and the communication around this was all pretty terribly made as well. Reinstalling the same game or just launching it from a subscription service like Game Pass weren't clearly defined. There is no way to know how Unity plans to count installs, and Unity actually started to backtrack and also make up rules, like saying that small developers beyond a certain threshold just wouldn't have to pay without any real clear details. Anyway, the pitchforks were already out and we got a bunch of really funny comments too. The CEO of Unity was added to the Wikipedia page for greed to say that he is, quote, one of the greediest people alive, and the developer called Megacrit called all of this a violation of trust and then said that, quote, we have never made a public statement before, that's how badly you have effed up. I respect that statement. Gamers are really quick to push back against their beloved developers being treated poorly, so we'll have to wait and see where all of this goes. Now, talking of gamers, if there's one thing that they can all agree on, it is that performance is ultimately super important. And if performance is something that's important to you as well, then your VPN of choice has to be NordVPN. NordVPN is the fastest VPN from all the major ones out there based on independent speed tests, and it is so fast that I routinely forget that I even have it turned on. Literally hundreds of megabits per second based on the country that you're in, and with super low latency too. Of course, NordVPN has all the usual VPN features too. You can pick from all the countries that you could possibly imagine, you can use it to circumvent political censorship, watch shows from abroad, or surf on shady networks that you don't really trust, etc. And it is ultra secure. Too. All your traffic that goes through Nord is encrypted, there is a strict no logs policy, so they don't keep records of where you've been, and to back up their claims, Nord has lately even started open sourcing big parts of their software so developers can poke around in it and check if it is all as they say it is. I'm not a developer myself, so I just flip a switch and watch a bunch of shows from abroad, but you know, it's good to know. 
The Nord account covers six different devices, including even your router if you want to, so you can cover a whole family. And if you use my link, nordvpn.com slash Friday checkout, which you can also find in the description, you will actually get four months for free with a two year plan. That's pretty good, four months for free. And there's also a 30 day money back guarantee if you don't like the service. So there's basically no risk in giving it a try. So check it out. Be sure to use my link in the description to let them know I sent you and to get the discount. And I'll see you in the next video. Oh,